welcome to Pragmatic Paramedics and another episode with Scoobs. I had this patient. This is going to talk about esophageal varices. It's kind of outside of our normal chat because it doesn't uh, necessarily equate to what we do on an ambulance, but it might give you some insight to what to think about uh, when taking your patient to a facility. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to I Had This Patient, hosted by John Scooby Friedman and the Pragmatics. Thanks for tuning in. So we just want to remind everyone that the Pragmatics and their guests, opinions and thoughts expressed on our show are ours and theirs alone and do not represent their employer or their agency. Follow your state and local protocols. Don't deviate from them. Thanks, and enjoy the show. So, Scooby, what you got for us today, brother? Well, so y'all know I uh, recently, about six months ago now, got off the truck, became a nice you nurse, been plugging away at that ever since. (laughs) I'm absolutely a traitor, and I've never looked back. I am very grateful for my time on the truck. It was one of the experiences in my life that has absolutely shaped who I am today, and the best day of my life was getting off the truck. My back doesn't hurt anymore. I don't have to work three jobs to pay my bills. My back still hurts a little bit. Yeah. yeah. But I get to wear pajamas to work. Like, I'm really not complaining. And tennis mm-hmm. shoes, right? Exactly. No more boots. You were as dance. What do they call them? Dance goods? Oh, yeah. The clogs. Yeah. All day, baby. I could see <laughs> nah, you sparkly ones. <laughs> Rhinestones. 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 But no, in all seriousness, it's been a great experience. I've been learning so much. It's like drinking from a fire hose. I have like four different up-to-date tabs open at all times on my computer because there's always something new that I've never seen before. So this patient I'm going to tell you all about was one of those that I had really never experienced before. You know, I came into work uh, and I checked my assignment sheet and I see that I'm one-to-one. So I just have this one patient instead of having the normal one-to-two ratio. And usually when you're one-to-one, it's either going to be a really good shift or a really bad shift because it means your patient's either you know, big sick, or on the other hand, maybe they're just need a really close eye on them because they have the potential to be big sick. But either way, it's always a good, interesting time. Not for the patient, but you know, so I see you, it's never good for the patient. (laughs) Absolutely not. And so I come in and I see a bunch of people outside my room, big red flag. And I see a crash cart outside my room, another big red flag thinking, okay, well, this will be interesting. And I come in to a bloodbath. I kid y'all not, there is probably a four foot radius around my patient's bed that's just blood soaked. So we're just laying chucks down, trying to, you know, even be able to get to the patient safely. I get a good look at my patient. And she's about 40 years old, you know, pretty much just skin and bones with big old belly and blood just pouring out of her mouth. And so I get report from the day shift nurse. She came up from the floor as a rapid response. She came in with ascites, uh, has a history of alcohol use disorder, as well as depression and anxiety. While on the floor, she had a little bit of a lower GI bleed, but then she came up to us after experiencing a bout of hematemesis and was brought up to the floor, intubated, and pretty much presented as I saw her. Uh, Blood pouring out. We didn't have great access. The day shift resident had thrown in a single IJ triple lumen that was somehow sutured at a right angle. So they were trying to run the Belmont, the rapid transfuser through it, and they weren't able to get much more than 10 or 20 milliliters per minute. And that was how I found them. That was what I got. So I did a quick exam. You know, obviously patient's belly is huge and bloated. Um, Airway is obviously secured. Uh, They're not breathing at all. They're on the ventilator. Uh, The vent is doing all the work for them which is in and of itself kind of a bad sign when a patient's just riding the vent like that without much sedation. I think she was on 50 or 100 micrograms per minute, uh, mics per hour of fentanyl. Circulation obviously is shot. She is on three pressors at this point. Um, I don't remember exact numbers, but we'll get there in a second. But she was on Levo, Vaso, and Epi. And then on top of that, uh, we're still, like I said, rapidly transfusing blood into her. 
otherwise physical exam was completely unremarkable, completely fine. Just the fact that she's as yellow as a Simpson, uh, you know, her sclera are yellow, is her skin's yellow. Pretty much anything that can be yellow is yellow. So right off the bat, you know, we know pretty profound jaundice and pretty profound liver insult at this point. And so we were able to isolate that the blood was coming from her esophagus, not hugely surprising. And the working differential diagnosis at this point is esophageal varices rupture. And so what do we know about esophageal varices? We know that patients with liver injuries typically develop portal hypertension over a long period of time where their portal vein, their, their liver is not able to accommodate all of the blood that's coming to it because of the profound liver injury. And so you get this backup at the portal vein. And that portal vein backs up into the esophagus. And over a long period of time, it creates these little balloons that get a lot bigger in the about lower third of the esophagus. And when those rupture, it's a bad day because, you know, in normal bleeding, you apply pressure and you put a tourniquet on if you have to. And yeah, you can't really tourniquet the esophagus. And so at this point, we're kind of in just damage control mode. We're having to mass transfuse this patient. We're using pressors just to keep a blood pressure long enough so we can somehow intervene. And now the issue is GI doesn't want to intervene because it looks bad if the patient dies during their case. And if the patient's what they deem too unstable to intervene, they, they just won't. So we're kind of between a rock and a hard place. The patient doesn't get better until they can perform an intervention, but also the patient isn't better enough for them to intervene on. So like I said, we're pretty much just in crash, you know, damage control mode. So first priority for me at this point was obtaining better access because until we have, you know, a good flowing point of access, that Belmont's kind of useless. So the first thing I did was I drilled a humeral IO. She has no venous access whatsoever. Her veins are crap. I took a quick look with the ultrasound, couldn't find anything. Screw it, we're drilling. Now, you know, I asked the resident like, hey, like I'm gonna drill this patient, you cool with that? And, you know, she's of course like, yeah, yeah, do what you need to do. I said, cool, I'm gonna put in the humerus, you cool with that? Because that's not really a thing at my facility. Mm -hmm. Most of the time IOs, aren't really used because we've got central lines and IVs for days. And so, you know, I told her like, Hey, I'm gonna put this in the humor. Are you cool with that? She's like, well, can you do that? I said, well, I can, we'll find out if I get yelled at for it later. We were fine. Drilled a nice, uh, humor IO, got good right. flush. We was able to aspirate some marrow, hooked the Belmont up to it, cranked that bad boy up, had blood pouring in to the point that I was hang just sitting there hanging blood as fast as I could wound up having some help from some other nurses at this point, because if you've ever run a Belmont, you know that once you're at max flow, that's a full-time job just to keep hanging blood. Now let's talk about what our presser goals are for a second, right? You know, like I said, she's on three pressers and we're not getting a pressure. We're at, I think when I came in 50 over 20 or something crazy like that, um, my estimate was she'd probably lost two liters-ish. That was, And that was just what we could see, right? Because it's in the esophagus. The blood's going to come up and it's going to go down. Um, obviously passing melanin as well. So we know that varices, like I said, are a venous bleed. It's a central venous bleed. So regardless of who you ask, right, you know, maybe a fluid bolus does or doesn't raise CVP. That's a hugely hotly debated issue in critical care world. However, we know that if you over transfuse, you know, over fluid resuscitate, you will start seeing higher CVPs. That's just simple physics. So we know that we don't want to over transfuse these patients because at a certain point, you're just making the bleed worse. So to me, you know, my math is we want a bare minimum perfusing map. I've got an art line. I can titrate to a map. It's a little bit harder in the EMS and the combat, uh, combat medicine world to titrate to a map. You may be getting shot at. You may just have crappy, bumpy roads. So systolic might be easier. In this case, I was using a map somewhere between 60 and 65, you know, bare minimum just to keep her brain and kidneys and heart perfused. And of course, at this point, she's making zero urine. So we know that we're probably in a bad way. The next thing I did after establishing good access, getting that Belmont going, was I requested a gram of calcium chloride, PRN, every four units. You know, initially the docs wanted to go the calcium gluconate route, because that's pretty much all we give in the unit because chloride is really reserved just for codes. And, you know, maybe you'll mix it into a 100 cc bag and hang it that way. But gluconate is very slow 
to get out to the body because it has to go through first pass metabolism through the liver and then it actually becomes elementally free calcium couple issues with that. Number one, we need calcium and we need it right, right now. Number two, patient has a massive liver injury already. Are we really wanting to overwork, you know, put our faith in that overworked liver that that gluconate is going to eventually get out to the body? So for those reasons, I asked the doc for, you know, one gram calcium chloride PR and push. And doc said, well, why? Why do we need calcium? It's like, you know, this is the benefit of working with internal medicine docs. They don't do a whole lot of hemorrhage work. Right. And I explained to the team, because it was a couple of them at this point. It's like, hey, guys. So, like, you know, we're putting in a bunch of citrated blood products. That citrate is binding up all our free calcium. Number two, we're hemorrhaging pretty profoundly at this point. You know, we're losing liters. So, between those two things, we're almost certainly hy- hypocalcemic. And one of the, I think she was a PGY1, PGY2, asked, you know, hey, uh, can we just wait for a, you know, an ionized calcium? You know, can you draw an ionized calcium for us? I kind of shrugged. I said, we can, but it's going to be low. Mm-hmm. So I'd appreciate it if we could just, you know, empirically start doing calcium replacement. And so wh- why? Why do we need calcium, though? You know, like we know we're hypocalcemic, but we're also probably hypokalemic and hyponatremic and all the other electrolytes. But calcium is the one we really care about. Why? Well, calcium is a clotting factor. Your blood cannot clot without calcium. That's why we put citrate in blood bags, because we want to remove the calcium from that blood so it doesn't clot in the bag. But you want it to clot in your patient, right? Mm -hmm. You know, your bleeding patient needs clots. And so we overcome that citrate. We overcome that deficiency due to hemorrhage by just flooding them with calcium. So I think the current uh, DCR guidelines, damage control resuscitation, from the joint trauma system wants one gram up front with the first unit of whatever blood product you're giving. It doesn't matter if it's a unit of whole blood, a unit of PRBCs, whatever. One gram up front, and then every four bags after that, it doesn't matter what's in the bag, every four bags after that, you need a gram of calcium. Hmm. And I'll tell y'all, it's really hard to keep up with. You know, in this case, I was so busy hanging blood, so busy titrating pressors that you pretty much forget, you know, it's easy to forget. And so I had to write, you know, time that each calcium was given time, each blood bag was given. So that way, every fourth one I knew like, okay, now it's time. So whatever system you need to keep track of that, it's, it's still very important. Maybe not just as important as actually getting the blood on board, but it's very close, very close second. So let's talk about pressors for a second, because this is probably going to be a controversial thing. Are pressors ideal in a bleeding patient? Absolutely not. But on the other hand, when your patient is getting mass transfusion as fast as you can hang blood bags and they still don't have a pressure, they're going to die without pressors. They're probably going to die with pressors. But at this point in the game, what else can you do, right? This is kind of that last minute Hail Mary trying to just temporize this patient long enough to get GI to intervene. And eventually we did reach a point on... 50 mics per minute of Levo, 30 mics per minute of Epi, and 0.04 units of Vaso, that GI was willing to do a bedside scope. And so they went down the esophagus, they identified the varicy, they were unable to do anything directly to the varicy, the the bleed itself, the ruptured, um, that ruptured balloon we were talking about. Sometimes they can clip it, sometimes they can band it. In this case, it was too large, they were unable to. So what they did was they placed a Blakemore tube, a Minnesota tube, which depending on where you work, they might be different, right. have different names. So basically what it is, is it's a long balloon. It looks like a, you know, if you've ever had balloon animals, it looks like someone blew up one of those balloons, long cylindrical balloon. They put it in the esophagus, they inflate it, and hopefully that tamponades the bleed. In this case, it probably didn't because what we noticed was as we continued to transfuse this patient for about eight to 10 hours of my shift, you know, we're pouring blood in, pouring blood in, and no blood's coming out of her mouth now because the Blakemore is at least blocking that. But it's all going straight to her belly. Her belly's getting bigger and bigger. And this is going to make me sound callous, but mercifully, at a certain point, the physicians told the family, we're sorry, we're doing everything we can. And this patient is simply just not getting better. You know, your loved one is just not getting better. There is nothing more we can do. 
do you want us to keep doing what we're doing or would you like us to let her go peacefully? And the family eventually came to the decision that this wasn't what was right for their loved one. And they asked us to withdraw care. And I 100% stand by their decision. I will never question a family's decision to withdraw. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I, you know, working in the unit, you see a lot of these patients that are kept alive long past the point where they should not have been, where you're keeping a body alive, but not a person. Right. And so I will always applaud the families that have the courage to say like, no, this is wrong. Let's let them go. And in this case, that's what we did. Um, and as part of our postmortem care, we, unless the family wants an autopsy, we remove all of the devices. So in this case, it was all of the central access, all of the, uh, the Blake Moore's, the intubation, all of that comes out. And what we found was we, we did the math. We put in about eight to 10 liters total of blood products. It was five or six mass transfusion coolers. What we found when we removed that Blakemore was, like we suspected, all of that blood was in the belly. We suctioned four 1,200cc suction canisters filled out of her abdomen while we were doing our postmortem care. So, you know, we pretty much can extrapolate from that. Like, this patient was doomed. There was nothing we could do. So what can we extract from this to apply to our next patient? especially on the EMS side, right? Where you don't have the blood products, you don't have the the Belmonts, you don't have a lot of those fancy tools that help us. A couple clues that should alert you when that patient is, you know, at risk for these bleeds. Obviously, any history of alcohol use disorder, any history of hepatic cirrhosis or portal hypertension, those should all perk your ears up and make you think like, hey, you know, let's number one, you know, aggressively manage blood pressure. You know, if these patients get super uh, high blood pressure and they bleed, you're screwed. Let's be mindful of where we transport this patient, right? This patient had been transferred to us originally to the floor from outside hospital because we're a liver center. Outside hospital had not done an EGD to identify whether there's a risk of varices and had just kind of shipped her to us. Mm -hmm. So be mindful of where your specialty centers are. Be mindful that these patients will probably need one if they're sick enough. And so what happens if you get to this patient and they're already in this hemorrhagic uh, shock? Not a whole lot we can do, right? You know, I've seen some people asking me like, hey, like, can we carry a Blakemore on the ambulance? I mean, you can, but I don't think it's going to be very easy to place. Usually they're placed under fiber optic visualization. I really don't think that it's going to make beans a difference at that point in the patient's care. If you're at the point where as a paramedic, you're placing a Blakemore, your patients died and they just don't know it yet. But is it chicken before the egg kind of thing? Does a Blakemore come before the EGD or does the EGD come before the Blakemore? So for this case, they placed it during the EGD. Okay. Um, like I said, they're normally fiber optically guided. And once they're in, obviously, you're not passing a scope down the esophagus. Right. And really, they're only placed, like I said, kind of as that Hail Mary. Like maybe we can tampon out it long enough to uh, sustain the patient to get through. Maybe they can build some clots, that kind of stuff. And then finally, you know, like I said, you know, you're in this hemorrhagic uh, shock. You're, you're working this hemorrhagic shock patient and, you know, they're just copious amounts of blood coming out. This is really a patient that you as a paramedic need to be a patient advocate and say, is this care futile? Am I doing anything that's going to help this patient? Or is it more of a case where I need to contact my medical director and say, hey, this is futile care. This patient is a trump traumatic arrest secondary to a medical issue. I am not comfortable continuing care. What do you want me to do? Because at the end of the day, we are all patient advocates, right? We all got into this to do what is best for our patients. And sometimes letting folks die a peaceful death versus hammering on their chest and pumping them full of blood products and prolonging that agony is not in the patient's best interest. Lawrence Nightingale got a hold of you, didn't she? Oh, absolutely. I've gone to the dark side. (laughs) Especially too, you know, like, how many of us carry a blood product on an ambulance? I mean, if, not so, enough. If we, so if we see this patient presenting in, in their residence or at a, a skilled nursing facility, you know, all we're going to be able to do is give them at, at a min, at, at a minimum is crystalloids. Mm-hmm. You can do, can you do preemptive calcium? But if they're, if they're yeah. bleeding out and all you, if you don't have replacement blood. Well, I don't we, disagree. I'm just saying, can you? 
Like, is I it mean, going to be beneficial? We know they're going to be receiving mass transfusion. I think you can. I mm-hmm. think it's probably a waste of your time. If you take them to any trauma center worth their salt, they'll be getting the same amount of calcium regardless. One, yeah. And honestly, if you think about it, that calcium that you just put in is probably bleeding right back out anyway. It's not like they're going to magically clot because you push that one gram of calcium chloride. On the same vein, TXA is also a no-go in these patients. Um, what, was this, what was the name of that study? I just read it. Uh, halt it trial. Halt it, yeah. That they actually stopped halfway through due to futility. Right, right. Uh, basically, what they were finding is that it's impossible to identify when these GI bleeds start. And even Varices patients, I believe, were completely excluded mm. from the study altogether because of the same. And so yep. what they found was say, just there was no mortality benefit whatsoever. And let's clarify upper GI and lower GI bleed. So this was an upper GI bleed, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In these and obviously you said it. I just want to make sure that there's differences in treatments for patients with the, yeah. the issue. So lower whatever. GI is almost certainly a much slower kind of right. oozing bleed. But regardless, uh, we know that TXA is probably not beneficial in either case. Correct. This is a great patient case scenario from the ICU and to, you know, to bring it back to the truck medic, you know, obviously if we see a patient that's presenting like Scooby presented, you know, we're going to have to figure out a different route and a different course of treatment. We may not be able to save that patient, but are there any indications in patients that we may see on a daily basis that they may have a possible esophageal varices, Scooby, you know, yeah, like, so just to keep like our was- mind and, just to be able to use the starter. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so like, like I was that. mentioning, any patient with that liver history, you should maintain an index of suspicion. I would be very cautious about dropping OGs or NGs in these patients. Okay. Hemoptysis. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, your patient presents with either hematemesis or hemoptysis. Now, would it matter what what color the blood is? You know, if it's a bright red blood versus a dark red blood with or do you just not even just have that degree of suspicion either way? Not even to be to honest. That. You know, it, it has to be kind of your whole like clinical gestalt, right? You know, if mm-hmm. the patient, uh, you know, say they're homeless and they have they cough up little specks of bright red blood, that's a different index of suspicion for me than say, you know, middle aged woman who uh, vomits bright red blood. Perfect. But that was there was no pun intended with gestalt, right? <laughs> Sorry. Like I said, uh, you just have to clinically correlate what you're looking at versus you know, what your index of suspicion is, you know, like the, like my homeless guy, I'm way worried about some very different things with a dude coughing up flecks of bright red blood in in the homeless population. You know, I'm thinking TB, TB. I'm thinking some sort of, you know, at this point now we have to think COVID, uh, but it's some sort of probably respiratory issue when you're looking at these little flecks versus that bout of 500 cc's of bright red blood of hematemesis that's a different index of suspicion. And, you know, add in if your patients, you know, sclera or yellow and they say like, yeah, like I only drink three beers a day. Like, yeah. Okay. Me too. Yeah. Like King Cobra's a day. Also like if you're in somebody's <laughs> residence and you're seeing <laughs> moptesis with uh, beer cans and whiskey bottles strewn throughout the house. And exactly. You know, maybe some your tennis should, to your add tennis, in. Should, your tennis should go up low BP. Meds are a good thing to look at as well. I mean, yeah. if you, if you look at their med, med I would say probably protonics. They're probably okay. taking some sort of PPI, some proton yeah. pump mm-hmm. inhibitor. I mean, that's the big one. Uh, what's Zantac, the other? Zantac, rantididine. Would those be uh, an indicator or protonics is a bigger one? I mean, I they might just have GERD, right? Yeah, yeah. it could be GERD. But I mean, but if they're say on it's, pro- just Say it's GERD with alcohol use. But you can and ask yeah, them. Yeah. This is where the game starts getting interesting, right? Right, yeah. always. Yeah, because now you're trying to figure out if this is GERD, silent GERD, you know, do they have also, I mean, there's a million things that can come. But I mean, I'm looking, as soon as I see protonics or some sort of proton pump inhibitor, mm-hmm. I start to think both ways. Absolutely. But if they're not coughing up blood, clearly, I can move <laughs> my, uh, my uh, differential the other direction. Oh, absolutely. Liver medications. Mm-hmm antivirals this is a this is a disaster patient waiting to happen though for for absolutely i mean if if this presented while you're moving the patient from inside the residence to your truck and an esophageal is ruptured you're gonna have i hate to say very little chance of getting them back the word is you're fucked true yeah Mm -hmm. i mean yeah i I mean yeah 
That's a hard patient to, to manage. In and even if we EMS. did carry blood in EMS, I mean, how much blood do these EMS agencies already say? Two or three, two, two. or three, two or three units right. at a max. And mm-hmm. you, you know, Scooby said he put in ten, and they still weren't successful in you know resuscitating that patient. So, yeah, that's when the, the tough choice. Which yeah, so that's why I think I think he said it with going mm-hmm. to comfort care. Leaving yeah. him, leaving him at home, and letting the family make the call. I mean, obviously, if they're in your ambulance, you're kind of stuck. But yeah, but they're, they're I, I mean, the, the biggest thing is, is we got to remember if we're going to do that, we have to get medical control evolved mm-hmm. and to bless off on it. It can't be our own. Uh, oh yeah, our own and call. I, I gotta or say, the, what about the patient's family? So here's the question for you: So say you can't get medical control, your radio's down, and you, you're in BFE, Ohio, and you don't have any cell phone reception and the family said you go to the family and say, Hey, look, you know, they got esophageal varices and you know, there's a traumatic arrest. There's very little chance that we're going to get them out, get them back. Sorry. And, uh, they say, well, stop, stop care. Yeah. I know what I would, I would stop care. Yeah, absolutely. At the point where the patient is already arrested, then yeah, absolutely. I'm more than willing. And I've, been fortunate to work at services where I would be backed up on this to say, yes, family doesn't want us to keep going. Perfect. I am comfortable with my license saying that this patient is completely unsalvageable, you know, without any real meaningful outcome. You know, maybe if you plop them right into a surgical suite, maybe they come out with zero neuro outcome. Cool. I'm comfortable saying that, yeah, this is not, this is what's best for this patient. Let's go ahead and withdraw care. However, it gets sticky, right? When that patient hasn't arrested yet. Right. And in that case, obviously in the EMS world, especially we're bound to keep doing everything we can. We can't just say, well, they're going to die anyway. Let's just leave them here. Right. That's a really great way to wind up in federal prison. (laughs) Tough call. (laughs) So, yeah. And I mean, at the risk of getting a little too deep, I think those are some of those, you know, we call them moral injuries, right? Mm -hmm. That, we rack up in this business is that those patients that family demands you keep alive for weeks, months, long after they've expired. Right. Because most families uh, are not so easygoing about not continuing care. Absolutely. And it is a lot harder in this day and age because until very recently, patients were kept almost completely isolated from their family. Families couldn't come up to the ICU and see like, oh, like this isn't my loved one anymore. This is this weird shell of a human that has all these tubes coming out of them. Right. And that made it difficult for us to help folks in that decision. Uh, The one thing that I really, something that I found helps families make up their minds one way or another is that, you know, I've always sat them down and said, look, you know, you know what they would have wanted. You know what kind of life they led if this is what they would have wanted, then by all means, we're happy to keep going. But I don't think this is a life that anyone would want. And it's usually kind of a a nice realization for them to kind of have that outside validation. Like it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's okay that this isn't something that they would have wanted. It's okay to let go. So that's my soapbox patient advocacy speech for the afternoon. I like how it went from esophageal varices to patient advocacy and comfort care. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, whether we like it or not, palliative care is a huge part of emergency and critical care medicine. Oh, yeah. And now palliative care doesn't. It should be bigger. Absolutely. uh, And palliative doesn't necessarily mean that we're not doing other things. It means that we're doing everything we can to keep that patient comfortable. And if that leads towards withdrawal and comfort care, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I am 100% in. I'm 100% for whatever is in the best interest of my patient. Agreed. Agreed. So if you have to transport this patient because, Mm -hmm. what are you going to do? If I'm moving between like ER to ICU or if I'm moving from scene to to, scene? House to ED. I'm going to find the the nearest facility that has blood. Mm. I'm going to probably pre-alert. If I'm having to go to a smaller facility, I'm going to pre-alert for a flight. It's Um, an NPR. Yeah, I mean, if, if they're arrested, yeah, I mean, you're you're up the creek and it's just normal trauma arrest at that point. Right. But I'm moving towards that facility that has some blood in the ER. I'm pre-loading flight. I'm keeping that bare minimum map no matter how I have to do it. If it's small fluid boluses, if it's adding on Levo, Epi, I never carried Vaso. 
And I mean, y'all heard the wild Levo and Epi requirements we were at. Um, you know, 50 mics per minute of Levo is no joke. Another uh-huh. 30 mics per minute of Epi is also no joke. No. At yeah. this point, you're you're doing the bare you're doing what you can to keep that bare minimum pressure to keep them perfusing, but also minimize bleeding. Right. Hey, yeah. and you're probably throwing in some thoughts and prayers while you're at it. Mm-hmm. T's and P's. Yeah, I don't disagree. I think really all you can do is like you would on a trauma patient that was bleeding out. You know, you're starting lines, you get into the facility as quickly as you can, and you're trying to do the best that you can for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, now there's, I've read that there are some people want to do tubes, some people don't, don't want to do tubes. What are your thoughts on innovating if they're uh, obtended? You can make a good case either way, but the bottom line is if they have bright red blood coming out of their mouth, it's probably going their airway too. And aspiration will kill you just as quick, maybe not just as quick as exsanguination, but pretty quick as well. So you got to consider it um, probably a patient where if they're that obtunded, you might trial a ketamine only intubation, you know, 50 milligrams, 50 to 75 milligrams of ketamine, just the bare minimum to keep them down. But really, if you do a true classic RSI on this patient, they're probably going to code. Right, because they don't have a BP. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, we we talk about the hop killers all the time, yeah. and this patient's yeah. profoundly hypotensive. Right, uh, and you're probably and gonna becomes, have a dedicated suction. You know, your EMT, you're gonna say just you gotta keep the suction on. Don't mm-hmm. don't yeah. take it off. I mean, definitely a great case for the, the salad method. You know, yeah. jam a, a Ducanso catheter, whatever you got, into the airway. Sit them up right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, keep that head of the bed thirty or greater. Yeah, it's gonna be another disaster uh just intubating this patient alone is going to probably kill them mm-hmm. but also not intubating them could kill them so yeah pick your poison i guess yeah you're in a world of hurt just follow your protocol i mean mm-hmm. ultimately tell me there's a protocol out there that talks about gi bleed no no what i mean is if, <laughs> if you have to intubate or oh, your you protocol about, yeah. protocol tells you to follow that <laughs> algorithm follow the algorithm so you don't get in trouble i um, would yeah like, oh, okay check, like we check. said and if you're going to do palliative care or talk to the family and not transport make sure you get your medical medical director involved and she he or she blesses off on it to make sure that you're you know even though it may be the right thing to do doesn't mean that the people who manage your paramedic license think that it's the right thing to do yeah i mean as always the blanket statement applies of follow your local protocols and don't follow stuff that you heard from some goon on a podcast or goons (laughs) yeah so, hey, Scooby, great, great information. Uh, the reason we didn't do the pediatric uh, scenario that you all voted on was uh, we didn't have time to get the pediatric guru on, but we will do him next. So we're not even going to put up a poll this time. The pediatric trauma patient will be next. This is some great information from Scooby, as always, uh, learning and getting better at our craft. Aaron? Yeah, thanks, Scooby, as thanks, always. Scooby. Thanks make for sure, having me, guys. Make sure you follow Scooby on Instagram, St. Fisher on Instagram. Thanks for listening, and thanks for supporting our supporters and sponsors. Let's give a shout out to Priority One Air Rescue, Red Clover Coffee Company, Black Wolf Helicopters, Say Again Over Patch Company, and the Do It for Drew Foundation. We look forward to having you next episode.